ARC World Forum in Orlando, Florida. I'm pleased to present Andy Chatha, president of ARC Advisory Group. Hello, it's my great pleasure to have John Berra with us today. John is a senior advisor and past chairman of Emerson Process Management. John has been a visionary leader for our industry for the past 40 years. John transformed Emerson Process Management from a bunch of field device companies to major automation supplier over the past two decades. Welcome, John. Well, thank you, Andy. Those were some nice compliments. And let me also compliment you on the success and growth and longevity of ARC. Uh, I remember we did an interview 20 years ago, and here we are today. So it's great to be here. Uh, John, we've been uh, talking about all morning uh, about some of the new things happening in our industry, new technologies, new processes. Uh, in your view, what do you see over the next few years? Uh, uh, what products, what uh, processes will have a major impact on our industry? Well, I can think of a few. And, and I'll start with still the, the field device level where, you know, where I've lived for a greater part of my career. I think wireless is just beginning to have a transformative effect on the process marketplace, and it'll continue to do that. I also think a little further down the road, we're going to get a lot more out of simulation. And by that, I mean a simulation that runs actually faster than real time. So you can look at what's happening in the process, feed it into the simulator and actually get a predicting, a prediction of what might be happening down the road faster than it's actually really going to happen. And layering on top of these technologies, I think, will be the increasing use of what you spoke about, which is data analytics to make the business decisions so that these, the information is there, the analysis tools are there, and that our, uh, our customer companies, the process companies, can utilize any expert anywhere in the world to analyze and come up with the best approach, whether they're physically in that part of the world or not. John, under your leadership uh, over the past uh, you know, three decades, uh, Emerson Process Management has a great track record coming up with new products. You know, what process does Emerson have to develop actually a culture of innovation? Uh, uh, great question. I, I would say first off, the, uh, the culture of innovation starts with the leadership. And if it's not there, then the way you get it is for the leadership to understand that innovation is actually a competitive advantage. It's a strategy that can help you win against your competition. If you are out there ahead, even if it means doing some things before their time, you will generate this culture of innovation and you will wind up with world-leading products or services. But it, it really doesn't uh, stop with the leadership as well. There needs to be a process underneath for bubbling up ideas. They can come from all over the place. I, I know it's common practice to think that all visionaries are kind of like Steve Jobs, right? The, a single person who thinks it all up on their own. Frankly, that's not how it happens. The way it really happens is ideas come from all over the place, and there's a, a bubbling up of this process, and some good ones reach the top. And so you need a robust process to review these ideas. You need to have each person present an idea, have a day in court, but then you commit to some number, the top four or five, and that commitment is strong and steadfast you will undermine your culture of innovation if at the first moment of a financial crisis, you start pulling funding from those projects that you just got finished telling your people are really important and are gonna be important to the future of the company. You can't cut those. You have to have total firmness, resolve of commitment on those things. Obviously, there'll be some things that don't 
necessarily make it to the end of the line, that's fine, this always happens, it's a normal process. But the ones that do will be innovative, and then you get to celebrate. You celebrate and reward the innovation any way you can. You hold up the people who made it happen as heroes, you talk them up in their service awards dinners, in, their, in webcasts, you expose them to the rest of the company, they get uh, rewarded in other ways from career advancement and that sort of thing as well. So it, it kind of all goes together, but I think innovation starts with the leader truly believing that innovation is how you win. John, that really brings to the next question. Emerson Electric really has a great track record developing you know, great leaders you know, for many decades. Uh, uh, could you share with us a little bit about the process that Emerson goes through to develop these leaders? I sure can, and uh, thank, you for, thank you for saying that. Uh, uh, it has produced uh, many good people, and also a, a continuity of leadership, so you don't see the kind of leadership merry-go-round uh, at Emerson that you might see in some other places. Well, here's how it happens. First of all, there is a formal process of identifying those individuals who look like they have a lot of promise uh, to be future leaders. They're typically some of the newer people in the company, some of the younger people in the company, but it starts at the very beginning to identify those that kind of have the competencies we look for in our leaders. By the way, we have a defined list of competencies. There's 19 of them. I won't go into all of them on, on this one, but we look at those competencies and we try to measure people up according to those. And we tell them where they're strong and where they need to improve. But these ones that are selected as potential leaders for tomorrow, they go through a whole series over a number of years of executive leadership programs where they're brought to St. Louis to learn a lot about the corporation. They're given case studies to work on, kind of like a Harvard Business Review kind of thing. How would you make this decision? What would you do? Then they go back to their jobs and then they're brought back again six months to eight months later for another round of sessions, again, more focused on other things. So by the time someone has gone through a few years of this process, they've been through executive leadership at least three times. But then we, as management, we keep this active list and sometimes people enter the list and don't stay on the list, new ones come in, but we look at this list in detail every year. And that list, we determine if somebody has been given in the last couple of years, say a project of some kind to broaden their experience or an actual promotion or increased responsibility of some kind. If a, a high potential person has gone on too long without something to move them along, then we take uh, strong action uh, to make that happen. And then finally, we tell them that they are people that we think have uh, promise for the future. We want them to have a strong and viable career with Emerson, and the door is always open from the CEO on down to come in and talk about career and how best the company can serve their career goals. John, our industry is uh, losing a lot of uh, uh, people, you know, retirement and uh, uh, baby boomers and yeah. so forth, like us. Like us. <laughs> yes. Um, at Emerson, do you have a process to bring young people, uh, how you go about, you know, getting them excited and come and work for Emerson? Yes, uh, yes we do. And, you know, some of the things we do are things that many, many companies do, such as, uh, you know, intern and co-op programs uh, at, uh, at various engineering schools, uh, sponsoring various projects that the universities can do and involve the students. But we actually go beyond this. Uh, we believe, particularly for automation, that um, it helps to actually donate the equipment. Uh, so uh, at many of the universities today, not just in the United States, but around the world, we've put some of our measurement products, our valves, our systems in there so the students can, uh, so to speak, play with the toys and get exposed to what this is all about long before they ever um, get out of school. We also have programs where our executives will go into the universities to, in effect, talk up not only our company, but just you know, the automation and control field. It's hard to attract students these days into automation. There are other 
disciplines that come across a little more glamorous, even within engineering. You know, everyone wants to be a biomedical engineer today. But we talk about what control can offer them because you get to touch everything from mechanical to electrical to electronic to software to networking to high level sophisticated things, neural network, you name it. We touch it in the world of automation. So if a person is interested in a career with a very broad interest, they can come to automation. And finally, I'd say we talk about how automation can actually contribute. I think kids today want to contribute in some way, not only to their companies, but to the greater good. And what are we about? We're about making things safer. We're about making things more environmentally friendly. And we're about producing things with less energy. Now, what could be more fun to work on than those kind of projects? John, that's excellent insight. Thank you, John. Andy, thank you. I've uh, always admired your work and enjoy what you do for the industry, and it's always great to see you again. Best to you and your family as well. Thank you, John. We have been speaking with John Barra, uh, Senior Advisor and Past Chairman of Emerson Process Management. Thank you for watching.